on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. There's so many interactions. That's ecology. We're all in this web of interdependencies. It's one thing to go out and gather some things. It's another thing to leave behind abundance for future generations. The word Manhattan actually means the place where we go and gather hickory wood to make our bows. When we go around and we say, the way we're living is not sustainable, you can just jump ahead and go like, well, then it's going to end. So what's next? After the Enclosure Acts, Europe was rapidly deforested. It created all these refugees and then they came to America and then they did displaced the native people and then they deforested that landscape. Here we are like shooting rockets into space and carrying around supercomputers in our pocket and yet there's still a legacy of that pre-contact time in the forest. Real democracy comes from European encounters with indigenous societies. Democracy is the single most important thing that we can practice. Change is going to have to always come from the bottom up. Episode 111 of the Wild Fed Podcast, Nut Trees, Democracy, and the More Than Human World with Zach Elfers is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Sir Thrival's just released a brand new energy drink called Biomatrix. It's a natural, water-soluble, powdered energy drink mix based on an energizing concentrate of yerba mate. With a refreshing iced tea-like flavor and bright citrus notes, gives you a nice lift without the jitters of many pre-workout formulas. And it supports your natural energy levels with a custom blend of amino acids and adaptogenic herbs like shizandra berry, goji berry, and rhodiola root. If you're looking for a natural energy boost that won't leave you feeling wired, spun out, or depleted, check out Biomatrix at SirThrival.com. While you're there, take a look at the entire product line. As we head into winter, now's a great time to pick up a bottle of Sir Thrival's Daylight Concentrate, a natural vitamin D3 supplement like no other. And now through December 15th, Sir Thrival is posting daily deals across their social media accounts. Follow along for huge savings across the entire product line. Sir Thrival. Why just survive when you can thrive? This episode of the Wild Fed Podcast is also brought to you by Wild Food Warehouse. Are you looking for authentic, hand-harvested wild rice? Not that overpriced, patty-grown stuff you see in the supermarket, but the naturally occurring, truly wild rice that's forager harvested under Minnesota's strict ricing laws. Wild Food Warehouse delivers hand-foraged, wood-fire parched wild rice direct to your door. You can even use the coupon code WILDFED to get an additional 10% off your order. Wild rice is more than just a healthy, gluten-free grain. It's a sacred food that was and is a staple for the indigenous peoples of the Great Lakes region, where it's still hand-harvested from canoes today. Some of that rice makes it to market, and now you can get your own. Truly wild rice cooks up soft with a gentle, nutty flavor that's prized by chefs, epicureans, and of course, wild food enthusiasts too. Go to wildfoodwarehouse.com and use the coupon code WILDFED to get truly wild rice delivered direct to your door. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. We're joined today by Zach Elfers, a.k.a. at Woodland Rambler of the Nomad Seed Project. He was recommended to me by our friend and repeat guest, Jenna Roselle, who suggested I check out his work, and I'm glad I did. Zach has a unique suite of skills and a knowledge base that centers around the intersection of botany, horticulture, foraging, wild tending, and traditional ecological knowledge. As a member of the foraging community, Zach's going a lot deeper than mere plant identification or gathering. He's looking at creating large-scale, reciprocal, ecological relationships between people, the plants, the land, and the rest of the non-human beings we share the landscape with. And while this was a get-to-know-you kind of conversation, I left it feeling like this is the kind of thinking I hope can start to infuse North American foraging culture over the next decade. But our conversation quickly veers away from merely foraging and goes into some of the challenging to traverse terrain of socio-political aspects of our cultural relationship to the land and each other. Of particular interest to me is the juxtaposition of top-down versus bottom-up approaches to implementation. We look at indigenous versus colonial land management paradigms and discuss possible roads back to a more long-term, sustainable path of nature integration. This interview gets into some of the high-level, big-picture thinking that I really enjoy. It's a reminder that wild foods are about a lot more than what's on your plate. It's about how we relate to the landscape, to the creatures we share the planet with, and to each other as well. Because food is so much more than calories. It's a representation of how we choose to walk in the world. Zach Elfers, welcome to the show. 
Thanks for having me, Daniel. It's a pleasure. Yeah, man. Uh, there's some really interesting stuff you're into. And I, and I have the impression um, from the little bit of work of yours that I've been able to kind of uh, consume that uh, you go deeper into some areas around plant foraging and working with plants, um, wild and domestic, that um, is at a level that many foragers haven't really gone to or achieved. And so I'm really excited to kind of go to a deeper layer than I normally get to here on this show. Uh, so that's not any pressure. Uh, <laughs> let's dig into it. Uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. So first of all, I live along the lower Susquehanna River in uh, southern Pennsylvania. I'm not far from the Maryland line as, as the crow flies. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm pretty centrally located in the mid-Atlantic, which is a pretty, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of urban and, and as well as rural stuff in, in my area. But um, I, I guess I have a horticultural background. So I have a, a mentor who taught me the ins and outs of native plant propagation. And I, you know, when I was in my late teens, I started going down this path, volunteering on organic farms and getting into permaculture and all this stuff. And then when the, the native plant propagation piece came into my life, something clicked and I was like, wait a minute. So I'm already foraging and gathering all these wild foods. And now I know how to propagate these native plants. And so then that really set me on this path of seeking out um, deeper ways of, of doing this and basically finding symbioses. And I, I like to think of reciprocity as mm -hmm. at, the, at the heart of all of this stuff. And so that, that sent me on a path and, you know, I, I met other teachers and I read books and I spent a few years traveling across uh, North America, um, mostly in the continental United States, but um, that was really eye-opening just to, to be in different places, camping and living with the land and, you know, trying to learn about the, the native ecology and the foods that were available. And uh, that, that really, really taught me a lot, but I always knew that I needed to come home and that's always where my heart was. And so I feel very deeply rooted in this, this place where I live now, which is within 50 miles of where I was born. So, mm. you know, I, I know a lot of people tend to, to move away and, you know, there's uh, a lot of great reasons for that, but I, f I felt like, uh, I felt like I needed to do that where I was. For, for the reasons I was hitting on earlier, you know, there's a lot of, I'm centrally located in the mid-Atlantic, so there's a lot of urban stuff happening, there's a lot of suburban sprawl, there's, uh, there's a need, I, I, I feel that I, I, there's, a, there's a need for, you know, a more of a tending mindset where I live. Sometimes one of the things that comes up for me is when you start to make connections to species that are local to you, the idea of leaving and going to another bioregion, it's like, in addition to leaving your family and friends and institutions that you're familiar with, you're also leaving behind all these species you've befriended. And the idea of having to start over is kind of overwhelming sometimes, you know, the idea, like there's something attractive to me about moving out West, but like, I, I work with so many species here that I, the idea of leaving them all is like, mm, it's too much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, on any permanent level anyway. Well, yeah, we, we build these connections and they, they become, um, you know, deep, deep threads in our lives. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I traveled out West and I, I do get nostalgic, you know, I'll think about the ponderosa pine and the yeah, pinion yeah. juniper and, you know, uh, just the, the camas fields and, you know, mm -hmm. the, the oak, the oak savannas and, you know, all that stuff. And it, it really, you know, makes my heart sing. But I also, uh, you know, when I was out there, I was, I was homesick and, you know, yeah. I, so <laughs> mm -hmm. you got, you gotta, you gotta make a decision and, you know, so I chose to root in deeply here. Could you flesh out that term? You know, I think probably our listeners understand what you mean vaguely when you say reciprocity, but could you, could we get you to sort of talk about that a little bit so that we know how you mean it and why, and why you choose that word? Sure. So reciprocity, um, it's, it's based on listening and care. So if there's something or someone in your life who feeds you, you try to return the favor by feeding them. It's like a, it's like a very, it, it's a gift centered way of living. 
So in other, like if I, if I meet an apple tree in my life and I really enjoy eating the apples from that tree, I can plant the seeds from that apple tree and I can help it reproduce and have children and continued life. So that's, that's reciprocity. You know, the, the tree, the tree, the apple tree is giving me that fruit to eat and I'm giving it help in, um, in living on earth. Sometimes I feel really guilty eating wild fruits and then going to the bathroom in the house. <laughs> Cause I think like I'm breaking the bond a little bit. I mean, I, I know it sort of sounds like a joke. I'm kind of making it like a joke, but it's true. It's like, you know, I go forage a patch of raspberries. I'm full of all these seeds and, and manure and, you know, rather than going out and, and putting a plot down, it's like, goes into the septic tank that gets taken away. And it's like, Oh man, uh, the circle's not complete. Uh, I know that's so only one kind of way of talking about reciprocity and there's so much more, but um, you know, I think as foragers, sometimes we're, we're a little caught up in the taking part and not in the giving part. Um, I'm curious your thoughts on that. When you, when you get on a hilltop and look out at the foraging United States, you know, North American foraging landscape uh, and culture, um, how you view that, do you see that too? Or, or do you think uh, we're on the right track? Do you think that we could make some significant shifts? Yeah, we, we laugh about that, but it, it's totally true. You know, when I, when I go to the bathroom too, I'm also thinking about that. Like, why, why am I indoors? You know, why am I putting this into a septic system? I mean, I, I have campsites where there's purple flowering raspberry growing now. It's like a, <laughs> an, an, an Eastern thimbleberry um, growing around my campsite because, you know, I was like, oh, that seems like that bush, you know, that area seems like good habitat. And, you know, I pop a squat and uh you know a couple <laughs> years later there it is there they it's, are. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's a it's a beautiful thing and uh yeah. you know nutrient nutrient cycling is a very a very important thing to think about when you're thinking about ecology and uh you know i i, I do think about what the world would be like if we didn't have these cesspools and cest- septic systems everywhere mm. and we basically we on our, our settlements would be big kitchen middens and if you've heard of terra preta soil from the amazon um no i don't think so so in the amazon most of the biomass is or, or sorry most of the carbon is tied up in the biomass that's above mm-hmm. ground so right. the, the, the tropical forest and everything and all the stuff that you see but the soils themselves tend to be very nutrient poor because they're highly weathered they're highly leached there's been a lot of oxidation so amazonian soils are kind of yellow and red and just just not particularly rich but people have found that where native people are settled there's rich black earth and it can go oh, down yeah. for se- several feet and it's a combination of biochar and ash as well as waste like uh, manure as well as food scraps mm-hmm. crop residues yeah um, pieces of pottery all that stuff say ceramics is one of the things that i've heard too yeah yeah, yeah, ceramics, and it, it's uh, it's all kitchen midden stuff, you know. From, yeah, yeah. And uh, it it makes this incredible soil that maintains fertility for over a thousand years. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's the piece where it's like, uh, the, there's so much regeneration that could happen, but we've got these crazy systems in place that sort of cut off half the cycle. So what you were calling like nutrient cycling, you know, I really feel like that's that's one component of uh, the tending piece. And I think, um, I don't really feel like we completed your introduction. So I want to go back here in a second and just cue something up though first, which is, um, it's interesting how uh, you and I were talking just before we started recording. um, And uh, we were talking about how many of the landscapes that we currently, or especially species that we work with, um, you know, let's say stands of plants that we think of as wild, aren't always necessarily wild in the truest sense, but but have some kind of a cultural legacy that brought them there in the same way that those thimbleberries you were just talking about got to your campsite, <laughs> right? So, uh, except with with a culture in place that really understood how to work that and who had the time and the generational kind of um, opportunity to work it, um, as opposed to a campsite, you know, where we can get some of that happening, but we don't have 30 to 50 people, you know, all contributing and generations and generations. But uh, tell us a little bit more about um, your seed project and the other things that you do. Like, what's your current, kind of current work? And uh, then we'll get into some of this stuff. 
Sure. So the, the Nomad Seed Project, I'll start with that. I started that project probably around uh, 2017, the end of 2016. And that was during a phase of my life when I was still traveling a lot. And so part of it, you know, the, the, the play on the, the word nomadic, um, you know, was that I was learning how to do all this tending stuff while also not really having a home base, um, kind of kind of doing it from the go. But it's evolved into a research and writing project. And I've been trying to go through systematically various edible and medicinal plants of um, especially my bioregion and just going through their, their cultivation and their, their propagation and the whole life cycle. So one of the things I try to share with people when I'm teaching is to observe a plant in its full life cycle. You know, we, we all know to go out to the pawpaw grove when the pawpaws are ripe, but do we go there in the spring and we see the flowers come out, you know, and you've got the, the green on the flower, which is the, the male flower, and you've got the deep purple, which is the, the female flower. And, you know, you can watch the buds swell in the spring and, you know, erupt into leaves. And then you, you go there in the winter and, you know, all, all the leaves are down. Um, there, there's a whole life cycle in there. So with, with ramps, ramps are a great example. A lot of people come out in the spring and they gather ramps when the, when the leaves are up and then they'll take the bulbs at the same time. But actually the best time to take the bulbs is in the fall. Yeah. So if you, if you go out in the middle of September, those, uh, there will be, you know, onion scapes, uh, you know, like little humble onion flowers with little black seeds all in that umbel. They look like little BBs or something. They're hard and round. And almost every one of them will germinate. I mean, ramps are so easy to grow. You could almost sow them into, into grass and full sun and they're going to come up. And, you know, when you go into the patch in the fall, you, you can dig the root from every single seeding head, leave the seeds in place, and you're going to regeneratively manage that patch mm. because you're, you're giving more than you're taking. Mm -hmm. Whereas if, if you're taking the bulbs in the spring, um, you're not giving, no seed. yeah, you're not giving the plant that opportunity to ripen its seed for that season. Um, you know, this thing you're talking about, I feel so guilty of it. Uh, um, I tend to be there when there's the edible portion that I'm after. And it's not for lack of being interested in a particular plant, but it's that I tend to go from thing to thing to thing all year, you know, and hunting and fishing and all those things that kind of put the wild food together for me. And it's like, I forget about something until it comes back around till it's useful to me. And um, that's the component. Like that's for me where the cycle's broken because immediately, as you say this, I, <clears throat> I intuitively understand that if I did more of that, uh, I wouldn't need to necessarily pick up a book that explained to me how to, you know, better tend to that plant. You know, I could learn it by just watching the plant. Some of this stuff would become pretty apparent, I bet, you know, over time. Yeah. It's, it's no different from our relationships with people. I mean, if you've got a friend and you only see them in certain contexts and when, when you want smile something on their face, when you want something, <laughs> yeah. you know, are, is, is that a true friendship or, you know, yeah. it's a true friendship when you see them in a more a full spectrum of who they are they're, yeah. they're dark times they're light times you know they're hard times they're good times and all that stuff um yeah so i'm involved in some other stuff too i um actually uh have a nursery i'm finished i just finished my third season of growing there i'm calling that future forest plants so there's a website for that too and I'm also involved with some people and we're building a nut cooperative for our region. And that's the Keystone Tree Crops Cooperative. So you can mm. go to, and uh, yeah, so we're, we're really, really excited to be working with our, you know, bioregionally native trees. Cause I mean, we, we live in the middle of the largest deciduous hardwood forest on earth. Wow. And, <laughs> you know, we've got this amazingly rich heritage of nuts and, and fruits too, but you know, I'm, you know, black walnut, butternut, hickory, pecan, hazelnut, chestnut, you know, it, it just goes on, you know, we, um, a lot of these, you know, uh, wild nuts are very, very heavily overlooked and we're, we're trying to change that. Overlooked by, when you say that, who do you mean? 
by well, the, other I, wild food enthusiasts or by the public at, at large? Well, I think wild food enthusiasts have always mm-hmm. been aware of these things, but I, I think our goal is to basically make sustainable cottage industries around mm-hmm. around the, these nuts where we can provide right livelihood to people who want to just work with these trees. And so we're, we're trying to figure out a model um, where we can integrate gatherers and foragers um, to, to go into wild public spaces and gather nuts, but also go to people's private property and gather nuts. And, you know, it's a cooperative structure. So we, we all work together and, you know, the, the producers um, make the nuts, you know, and then, or the, the trees are the producers themselves, right? But somebody might own that tree. That's mm-hmm. where it gets a little right. dicey. And then so you, you, the gatherers come out and they, they gather that abundance and then they take it to the processors who can uh, turn that into a value-added product. Um, if it's a hickory nut, for example, that might mean um, cracking the nut and extracting the kernel so that it can be, so you, you can go and buy bagged hickory nuts like you would bagged pecans. Yeah. But it, but it also includes making oil out of the nuts. You know, we're working with uh, the, the bitter nut or yellow bud and hickory, which we learned from Sam Thayer. Um, and then there, there's other aspects, like you can take chestnuts and make it into flour. Um, and then, you know, that goes to the distributors, ends up in sh- the hands of chefs or on local market shelves. And then ultimately it ends up as nutritive food for mm-hmm. people in the community. Yeah, which which leads to changes in perspective about um, the plants themselves in the landscape as well, right? Once people understand that there's a, you know, in this in this economic market that we live in, I'm trying try to say this without any kind of judgment on it. It's just like in this marketplace we're in, if you don't perceive value in something, uh, it's pretty easy to have it hewn down or or forgotten. And, and you know, there's something important about people knowing that there's some value there uh, for them. I, I think that anyway. And and one of the things, you know, you mentioned Sam Thayer. Uh, he's so, I think like for anybody who knows him personally understands like how much he's done to further some of these things, you know, whether it's with Hickory or whether it's with Acorn, you know, I mean, he's done such incredible work and I don't know that people who read his books fully understand like how much he's done on that. You know, I remember talking to him about the, the commercial viability of Acorn and he was like, <laughs> I was just blown away at the level to which he had explored it. I just was like, oh, I'm in the presence of somebody who's gone deep with this, you know. Uh, I was also recently, uh, I had uh, folks from Hammonds on who do the black walnuts, you know. It was really interesting to see what they'd done and how they actually procure all those nuts from from people who gather them, you know, rather than doing it themselves. It's pretty interesting. So what kind of models yeah. do, do you see this? Do you guys, have you, are you in fledgling stage or has any of this actually started to roll out yet? Uh, I would say we're still in fledgling stage. I mean, you know, we are officially incorporated as an LLC and we have access to some equipment and, but we're still definitely in kind of the ragtag Motley crew (laughs) phase of (laughs) phase of this. So, you know, it's going to get legs more and more as, 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 uh, as we do more. So, you know, we're just kind of holding the course, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting point you make, you know, like getting people to value these trees because a lot of people have kind of poo-pooed the idea of growing nut trees because they'll say, oh, well, why would I grow a hickory nut? It's going to take 30 years before it bears. First of all, that's not really true. It, it will bear quicker than that, you know, try, try 12 to 16 years. But the, the other thing is that these, these trees are already all through our ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Right. And so we get in this frame of mind where we think we have to do it all. We have to reinvent everything. And we've got this farm field and we want to transition it to agroforestry. So we're going to plant all of our fruit and nut trees now. And that's great. And I encourage everybody who has the access and the resources to do that to be doing that. But uh, don't neglect what's already out there. We've got so much abundance. And that's what I really appreciate about Sam is that he, he, he gets it. You know, he's, he's a true innovator and he knows how to, um, you know, basically capture this abundance and, and share it mm-hmm. with, with people. When you brought up ramps earlier, um, it makes me immediately think about uh, one of my favorite uh, ramp spots, which 
uh, are a set of islands that uh, Arthur Haynes brings me out to. He's sort of the steward of, and they're uh, within a mile of a traditional um, Abenaki uh, maize plantation and mm-hmm. a big settlement along the river. And these little islands are from one end to the other covered in ramps. Um, they are not a true wild <laughs> population. Uh, they've clearly were tended for a very long time. And the amount of food that's there in the spring, and, and you know, you're very familiar with these like riparian floodplains, um, that it's not just ramps, you know, it's our fiddlehead ferns, it's spring beauty, it's like, you know, it's the whole suite of ephemerals, spring ephemerals. Um, and the amount of food there sometimes to me is just staggering. I mean, I'll step out there into this and, you know, and, and I say that maybe where you are, that's like, well, whatever, but here in Maine, where we have about 100 uh, stands of, of ramps in the whole state, um, and most of them are, are pretty small, this stands out as something very unique. Um, and I remember also uh, sitting with Sam in Kentucky not long ago. And him looking around and saying to me, do you see all of these nut trees? Uh, These are here because of widespread, you know, fire management on this landscape. And these are trees that have survived that. And that's why they're so big and mature here. And it's just this thing that keeps coming up for me is that's like, it's one thing to go out and gather some things. It's another thing to leave behind abundance for future generations. And, um, through something other than what we typically think of as agriculture. And that gets me really excited. I know Sam calls it eco-culture. Um, and I know you talk a lot about cultural landscapes. And so could you kind of fill in the blanks there of what I've left out or maybe start us at the beginning and explain to people how, when we step out into, you know, when we step outside of the confines of our sort of urban landscape, sometimes what we're seeing, uh, just like for those first Europeans who set foot you know, along the East Coast who stepped in and thought what they saw looked like parklands, but, you know, was some kind of Garden of Eden of of just wild nature. They didn't understand these were highly tended landscapes. Like, help us put all that together and understand that a little bit. Ooh. (laughs) (laughs) Not a question, really, but a a preamble. (laughs) That's a great segue into uh, an example I'd like to share. We'll get back to the show in a moment, but first... This episode of the Wild Fed Podcast is brought to you by Red Kill Mountain Homestead Farms. Red Kill Mountain is home to New York State's largest wild apple savanna. Overlooking the east branch of the Delaware River is a beautiful hillside covered in wild apples grown from seed. These apples aren't the name varieties of grafted clones you get in the store. These are wild seed-grown apples. The apple season's just about over, but Red Kill Mountain Homestead Farms is shipping their wonderful dried apples apple molasses, apple spread, and bourbon barrel maple syrup. I get really excited about their apple molasses, also known as cider syrup. Apple molasses was a traditional sweetener used in homestead kitchens before the availability of inexpensive sugar products, and today it's listed by the Slow Food Arc of Taste as an endangered food. Red Kill Mountain is one of only three producers left in the country. Red Kill's apple molasses is made by pressing fresh sweet cider from their hand-selected, genetically diverse apples, and then reducing it down into a syrup with the consistency of molasses. It's sweet, but with an incredible complex bouquet and flavor profile you won't find in other sweeteners. It's great for holiday dishes, baked goods, roasted vegetables, and is perfect for apple pies and crisps. You can even add a tablespoon to hot water for a quick hot cider drink. Head over to redkillmountain.com and use the coupon code WILDFED for 10% off your order. Red Kill Mountain Homestead Farms. Truly wild, truly diverse apples. Now, back to the show. So there's a there's a grove of shellbark hickory that I like to visit. It's uh, along the Conococheag Creek in Franklin County, Pennsylvania, not far from a little town called Fannettsburg. And the, that particular valley that that town is situated on is called the Path Valley, which is a shortened name for Tuscarora Path Valley, because the Tuscarora Nation, when they were traveling from the southeast up to join the Haudenosaunee and become the the sixth uh, nation. They Mm. traveled right through that area. So that's that's an ancient native trading path that, you know, even before the Tuscarora traveled on it, it was, you know, certainly used and tended. And so what I find along this Conococheague Creek is a lot of shellbark hickory 
And shell bark hickory is, is uncommon in Pennsylvania. So, you know, where, where you find it, you can find large groves with thousands of trees. But if you look at a map and you see where the groves of shell bark hickory are, they're kind of scattered and few and far between. And so it, it you know, kind of begs the question, well, how did they get there? Because these are the largest nuts in North America. I mean, they're even bigger and heavier than a black walnut. And sure, squirrels. Oh, wow, really? Oh, yeah. They, they're like the size of, some of them can be the size of baseballs. Oh, my God. Um, I'm looking them up now. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so squirrels can, you know, conceivably they can move a nut like that. I mean, we know squirrels move black walnuts around, but are you telling me that, you know, squirrels and blue jays and, you know, other uh, animals like that are crossing the mountains, you know, for quite a distance and then going you with, know, an, into with the next a nut, nut. With, a, <laughs> with a nut like that, right? It just, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. So let, let me try to describe the, the landscape around there. So in the Path Valley, it's, uh, you got limestone bedrock and, you know, you got some areas where there's limestone and shale that overlap, but the hills all around there, the, I mean, it's, you know, it's surrounded by mountains. We're talking about Northern hardwoods. You got birches, you've got beech, you've got sugar maple, you've got Eastern hemlock, you've got, um, you know, some like red oak and, chestnut oak and, and thing, things like that. So there's this spot I think of along the Conococheague where that's what you see. You see these northern hardwoods and then it drops down to the floodplain of the, the creek. And what do you find in the floodplain? You find shellbark hickory. It's dominant. There's shagbark too, but there's even more shellbark. You find black walnut, you find white oak, you find honey locust, you find mm -hmm. pawpaw. And under in the understory of the shell bark is ramps very thick <laughs> oh wow it's a fun forest oh yeah and they're not in the uplands mm -hmm. you know they're just nice. in the they're in the grove of of shell barks and uh you know if, if i want to get even more technical and go into the science of this there's an interesting thing that's happening with the shell barks there if i gather all the nuts from within a few acres in this forest I'll notice that they're all different sizes. They're all different oh, shapes. Wow. They have different shell thicknesses. They even have different flavors. You know, some nuts will taste almost like banana bread. Some will have hardly any flavor at all, just real mild. Some will have pronounced maple overtones, like that classic shag bark flavor mm -hmm. that we all love. And some will be more on the savory side. Um, some will be mildly sweet. And, uh, you know, you got all kinds of different shell thicknesses and, shapes and sizes and that's that's not an accident that's because these uh these seeds were traded and they were translocated across different regions you see the same thing with the wild apples in in central asia in like kazakhstan you know they're all different shapes and sizes and colors and flavors and that's because of hybridization so this is a little hard to explain, so I'm, I'm doing my best. But so the classic example of hybridization is where you get two closely related species and they get together and they produce offspring and then you have this kind of hybrid. But species is not real. Everything is a spectrum. You know, species is just a, a categorical um, thing that we as humans make to you know, help us make sense of the world. It works pretty good up to a point. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like as long as you're in the middle of that spectrum on something, it's like, yeah, that seems pretty distinct. <laughs> and then get to the edges and it gets kind of fuzzy, right? It certainly does. So here, so let's think within a species. We're going to think just within shell bark hickory. You can still have hybridization because you can have shell barks that lived in this valley in Pennsylvania for hundreds or thousands of years. And then you can bring shell barks from a valley in Missouri that have lived there for hundreds and thousands of years. And you can mix those seeds together and you can plant them out. And, you know, you're going to have different genotypes, right? You know, and those trees are going to grow up. And when they start to reproduce, there's going to be this level of hybridity yeah. that's going to express. And that hybridity will basically open up the genome. And then you'll have all kinds of diversity, all kinds of things that are, are popping out. Um, and this is what I believe is happening with that grove of shell barks. You know, it's on the Tuscarora Path Valley. People traded seeds for centuries, if not millennia. And, you know, who knows where those seeds came from, but 
they all got together and they mixed and they made something beautiful. And so you've got like a deep gene pool there and all of these different phenotypes in this small area because so, because the, you know, examples of this species or this tree were there were brought from different regions and they were all kind of put along this river valley. And then it's created this forest with all of this uh, like phenotypic diversity then. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, essentially. Uh, I mean, native people were certainly managing those, those woodlands too. Uh, for example, the name Manhattan, there's this linguist named Ives Goddard who um, realized that the word Manhattan actually means the place where we go and gather hickory wood to make our bows. <laughs> because, <laughs> because it, <laughs> so awesome. that is so cool man i love that so wow. th- there was a there was a legendary grove of shell bark hickory that grew on the south end of manhattan island and all the groups of the uh of the lower hudson valley knew about this place and they would go there and you know they would you know they, they would gather the young saplings for bows but you know presumably they were also gathering nuts and mm-hmm, you know you, th- right. you think about it and you're like well how would how would one manage a uh, quote unquote wild gro- grove of shell bark hickory? So keep in mind, we don't have like these arbitrary private property distinctions. We just have the grove existing where it is because the soil types are right. The conditions are right. And it can stretch from several acres to several miles hmm. and everywhere in between. And so basically as you're going through that, that grove every season, there's some trees that just stand out. They're exceptional. Wow, the nuts on this tree are so good. You know, they're they're big, they're delicious. They crack out so easily. And then you're gonna come to other trees where that's not gonna be your experience. It's like, oh, these nuts are little and the shell is really thick and they don't really crack out well. And, you know, it's great for making into like hickory tea, you know, like pounding the, the mm-hmm. nuts in a mortar and pestle and, you know, putting them in boiling water. But like, it's not the yeah, kind of thing nut you're- meats out. <laughs> yeah, it's not the kind of thing you're gonna sit there with your stone and crack out the meats one after the other and really <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> enjoy yourself. So hickory is an amazing wood for making bows. And so the, those lesser desi- those trees that are less desirable might get turned into a bow. The other thing is that hickory seeds itself prolifically. And if you go into a hickory grove around the edges where it kind of transitions into the open field, you'll see just tons and tons of hickory saplings. And those hickories that are like three, four, five inches in diameter are the perfect size for making a bow. Making bows. I would love for um, Alicia Keys and uh, what's his name there? Uh, Beyonce's husband, um, the rapper there, they do the song new york i would like love a song about what manhattan actually means i feel like like (laughs) yeah jay-z and alicia keys (laughs) like the real meaning of manhattan uh yeah that really blows my mind you know yesterday i was talking to a archaeologist phd who uh studies the first people first peopling of north america you know such as like an intense mystery and i was talking about how how I, i get kind of annoyed with the paleo diet kind of idea where it's like people only they were only eating meat and i'm you know, and I'll be like, yeah, but that's impossible. Like, that's not what people do. And, and uh, it's like, well, there was big game, but there wasn't enough plants around. It's like, well, what did the big game eat? And then finally, it's like, I was talking about this. I was like, they killed these big game with, with bows or with atlatls or with, you know, spears, like that's wood. That means there was trees around, you know, like how can people <laughs> think that these people didn't eat significant amounts of plants? You know, it's like you have wood to make bows or, you know, half stone tips to 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 spears but you don't have enough for for nuts to be around like doesn't make any sense yeah, um, yeah anyway sort of a diversity <laughs> that's, one, there, that's one of the prejudices of archaeology we have this yeah. we have this phrase the stone age but it was anything but it was the plant age it's just that the lithics are all that remain that's it and we know that like you know like how are they making fire like they were doing it with friction that means that they had low ignition temperature woods and you know, the idea that there wasn't food being consumed from plants, but just used for tools. It doesn't make any sense either. So uh, anyway, uh, you know, I I think, um, can you describe uh, from a broader perspective, at least, you know, in the Eastern woodlands, um, how, what were the sort of suite of techniques you've been talking about a little bit with, with nuts here, but talk about a little bit about what landscape management looked like. Um, you know, in a big picture way, because, you know, lest people think that 
you, I, I, there's this almost like this bias that people assume native people are, are only, you know, pre-agricultural uh, indigenous groups, like as if they're not working the landscape, but rather just harvesting from it. So it's almost that thing we were talking about that maybe not seeing the reciprocity piece. So could, could you talk about the sort of suite of techniques that are used? So you've been talking about trading of seeds and planting along this, this river valley, um, but obviously there's a lot more going on there too. Sure. Yeah, there were a lot of things going on. I'm going to try to encapsulate it in just a few ideas, and then hopefully we can pick up the threads a little later because <laughs> I tend to ramble. But uh, the, the first one is the slash and burn or swiddening style of agriculture, which Native people all across the continent, but especially in the more woodland forested areas practiced. And, you know, what, what they were doing was basically growing the, the three sisters to, to start with, you know, the, the annual plants, um, corn, beans, and squash, including sunflowers and tobacco and um, chilies and, you know, uh, chinopods and all kinds of other annual plants. But then those clearings that they made would give way to perennials because that's, that's the natural cycle of things, you know, Just the succession. succession happens, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then, so then they would be intentionally planting trees into that space and eventually it would transition into forest garden and then into woodland and then eventually it would look indistinguishable from old growth forest again and then they could go back in and you know slash it out and burn it off and continue the cycle again so this is how a lot of anthropogenic forests were created in places where they didn't exist before mm -hmm. Um, but then there's all kinds of other things that were happening. Um, prescribed fire was a huge part of that. Prescribed fire is relevant for the slash and burn because it's the first initiatory step. But then there's also landscape level fire. You know, think about like a prairie fire or mm -hmm. burning, burning under a woodland for several miles or something like that. Um, fire was really helpful for hunting and for managing game. So again, you know, in anthropology and archaeology, there's a lot of myopia because we, we just, we don't really know exactly what was happening. Um, there's a lot of accounts of Native people using fire to hunt, but as far as I know, nobody has suggested that Native people were using fire to do something akin to holistic management. Wow, and, that's crazy because that seems like something that people that I hang around with talk about, but you're saying it's not been, been really recognized in the, in the literature. I think it's pretty clear that they were doing that. Um, but again, it's like a lot of this stuff is detective work. You know, we don't, right. because of the legacy of colonization and the, the genocide that was perpetrated on native people, we just don't have, we don't have all the data points that we would need to make like, you know, my firm scientific conclusion. So, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> right. But, but it's true that bison were in the East coast. Uh, they were, they were, they were pretty significant. I mean, in the Piedmont of Virginia and North Carolina, they, the old timer accounts would talk about seeing heads of bison for like yeah. in the, in the thousands, in the Can you thousands. Imagine? Can you imagine that? It's just yeah. like, wow. Like a woodland bison, you know? Yeah. Woodland bison. And, you know, as soon as the plus elk, right, would have been and, and elk prolific there. Yeah. And as soon as the people were displaced and genocided, so too were the bison. Now, a lot of that was intentional, you know, especially out west in the Great Plains. There were there were campaigns to destroy the bison because it was the life way of the native people there. And it was, you know, it was uh some of the the, the the perniciousness of racism you know is is so strong that I, I, not only will you be prejudiced against these people but you're going to be prejudiced against what feeds them you know <laughs> there's um i just want to say uh i think this is I, i'm not saying this to contradict you really in particular but like there's been some interesting work done on uh that i just read a fantastic um book i forget who the editor is but it's maybe 12 scientific papers or something like that and um from all you know, including um, uh, Lakota view on the whole topic. But it's interesting, there, there's a rethinking of the attack on the food supply thing that there turns out to not be any real support for that. Like that may have been huh. happening, but there's no, um, it's all based on uh, a hearsay account that that was said in a, in a courtroom at one point. Um, so yeah, I recommend uh, Dan Flores on that because uh, it's, 
they've they've parsed out a much more nuanced i mean for sure that the coup de gras was definitely those hide hunters out there you know that's definitely how it all the whole thing came to a head but but uh, yeah, there's some interesting science that's been uh, done on on the topic, especially looking at what the populations actually would have been, um, the role that um, native horse populations played in food competition. There's a whole bunch more that has been kind of uncovered. Uh, but okay. still, I, I would definitely still second your pernicious racism argument <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that's clearly going on. But um, I also wanted to add to uh, just one piece, which is I think we all like forget this sometimes, but this period of time you're talking about um, would have seen huge flocks of passenger pigeons, and they must have played a tremendous role in fertilizing forests. And and I mean, it's just easy to forget about them because they're not here now, but uh, they would have been uh, down there as well. Yeah. Yeah. There's your nutrient cycling again. Right. They, they, <laughs> yeah. they talk about the passenger pigeons as this massive phosphorus pump, which uh, wow. some, some people have speculated that um, the chestnuts died out soon after the passenger pigeon because the oh, passenger wow. pigeon was one of their primary sources of fertilization no kidding wow but, but anyway dan flores is he the guy who wrote coyote america he is yeah yeah but okay he, he's kind of most known for his uh he did a paper on bison kind of initially it was to um contest that you know that long-held belief that there was this american campaign on the bison and then um and then he's part of this book bison and the people i was just talking about he does a he does like a review of the current literature and sort of where where all that's at because the story's changed a lot um i just had i just happened to be out in, in standing rock and so i got you know sort of started doing deeper research than i had done before on the bison story but uh anyway, okay yeah something yeah well thanks up. thanks for that i'll look into that yeah, um it, it actually leads in nicely to uh, you know, my, my next story i was going to talk about you know what holistic management of the bison may have looked like and if you if you go into the, the what the pre-colonial landscape looked like, it seems like a lot of the valleys, the open areas, were they were burned so regularly that they basically were prairies and, and oh, savannas. So they cool. they were mostly they were mostly open and grassy, and where you had really dense woods, like what we would think of as old growth, would have been on the slopes. It would have been in the really moist areas. It would have been in the in the hollers, you know, like the north facing. Um, shady, cool, you know, moist, moist places. Um, whereas a lot of the uplands, which were flat and um, had well draining soils and good solar exposure, would have been more like prairie. Um, wow. So, what's interesting about where I live, I, I live in southern York County, Pennsylvania. And historically, back in the day, when people were first settling the area, they called it the Barrens because it was treeless as far as the mm. eye could see. <laughs> and so people actually thought it was because the soil was poisonous and no, nothing would grow there. They didn't realize that it was because people had just been using fire for so long that yeah. it, had, it had been transitioned into, into prairie. Well, actually, it wasn't even transitioned into prairie. It, it, sta- it remained as prairie ever since the last glacial maximum. Wow. Because okay, the, wow. the, the, the fire was used. Yeah, and, from and, early on. Right. We know this because there's a serpentine barrens there that uh, historically were the largest core grassland in, in eastern North America. And there's this little fame flower that grows in those serpent, serpentine barrens and its closest disjunct species is in the southwest. Wow. So basically what that means is that habitat has remained open for at right. least 10,000 10, right. years. Wow. 10,000 years. Um, I, another thing that had come up recently uh, talking to this uh, professor was, uh, sorry, this PhD, he was saying um, that the new genomics work where they're taking sediment and they're actually able to find um, pretty good segments of uh, different genomes in there, like uh, in soils, and they can start to see without having an archaeological record, they can start to see what species might have been there. And he was saying that uh, some of these folks think that even mammoths might have been extant up till 4,000 years ago. Oh, wow. You know, which is like new, you know, new yeah. news for me, but it's like trying to imagine what this landscape was like. Also, naively, I want to ask you this question. Maybe this is sort of silly and not a part of it, but um, I've I've had a few people on the show and been read several books recently about beavers and how many beavers there were prior to them being trapped out for the European markets. And so I've got a couple acres of water on my property where uh, beavers have dammed it up, but I'm not seeing so many beavers anymore. I think they've 
my impression is they've sort of eaten out what they wanted to eat and they've moved down the stream a bit, but they maintain this dam. Um, now it's just like muskrats in there and stuff I'm seeing. But anyway, I keep thinking, what if they, what if the dam fails and they move on? Like what I'm going to be left with is a, is a sort of big open area in this forest, which I just, it's on my mind because I keep thinking like, I, I don't want succession to happen there. <laughs> I want to keep that open. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I wonder uh, where beavers tend to leave prairie behind probably very short term, but I wonder if they played any role. Maybe that's just too, too minuscule, but it seems like there were so many beavers. Yeah, there's so there's so many interactions. That's ecology, right? We're all in this web of interdependencies. And so certainly the beaver has an impact on the landscape, then the dams fail, and then you have these open areas and people probably moved into those areas and yeah, continued to yeah, continued to maintain them. And it's like the native trading pathways. Bef before those were pathways that humans used, they were pathways that elk and bison and other yeah. large megafauna would use as on their migratory circuits and then of course why did those megafauna travel in that way because they were following geology you know you look at the bison going from salt lick to salt lick and you know going right. from mineral spring mineral spring to mineral spring and so you know we're, we're all kind of we're all in this together <laughs> yeah very well said uh the burning piece uh, also i imagine played a pretty significant role in um the uh canopy as well as far as like what trees were more tolerant to it and what trees weren't things like that what do we know about that well our trees that are most fire tolerant are most of our hardwoods so the oaks the hickories uh persimmon um chestnut um mature tulip poplar and yeah so you'll uh, you, you'll see this in a lot of places where there's like oak and hickory is the dominant forest type. That's, that's another one of those things where it's, it's not really an accident. It's right. That's the, that's the legacy of so fire cool. on the landscape So cool. where, where fire doesn't really exist. You tend to see other things like birches and hemlocks and beaches yeah. and, you know, stuff like that. It's, it's amazing how far away, I mean, you know, here we are like shooting rockets into space and carrying around supercomputers in our pocket. And yet there's still like the legacy of that pre-contact time in the forest is still there. It's like, the, it feels like impossible that this much could have happened in such a short period of time that there, we still see it in the forest yet. Like society's moved on to this, you know, quote unquote progressed to this point so yeah. fast that you know that we're having this conversation like remotely like this through technology and yet there's still <laughs> trees there that bear the evidence of the the type of management that was taking place yeah Absolutely. this this stuff you're talking about gets me so excited i think one of the things that happens uh, a lot i'm sure you get this from people you'll get this uh, sort of knee jerk response from people who um are intimidated by the idea of wild foods and they'll say something like, well, not everybody and there's 7 billion people, not everybody can do that. And I'm, and I'm often like, yeah, I, oh, that's fine. I'm not trying to say they can, <laughs> Whatever. I just, <laughs> I just like doing it. But, uh, but um, you know, Sam, there's always pointing out, Hey, the earth's already producing enough food for, you know, that many people uh, through agriculture, which is super inefficient. So perhaps this is perhaps it, let's not say it's impossible. And I, and that's kind of uh, opened my mind a bit, but obviously for that to happen, it would take these kinds of things happening again. Um, and just curious your thoughts on that. And also sort of like where, where we're, where we have such a um, what it, what, subdivided and, and fractured landscape now. It's like, how do we, <laughs> how do we even begin to practice anything like this today? Well, that leads me back to the Milpa. So one of the, one of the best books that I've read that I would recommend to everybody is called the Maya Forest Garden. Uh, the subtitle is something like 8,000 years of sustainable. The uh, Maya, like as in the people of the, uh, yep, the, yep. the Maya Forest Garden. It's written okay. by Annabelle Ford and Ronald Nye. Awesome. And so what, what they did is they've, studied the traditional um, Mayan milpa as it's practiced today by Lakandon and Yucatec Maya. And so what they're doing is they're beginning with the slash and burn, and then they're growing the annual plants. But 
when they when they seed this place, they can seed up to 80, 80 to 120 different species at once. So people think, oh, okay, they're just making a, a clearing with slash and burn and they're planting corn beans and squash and a few other things, and then they're abandoning it. That's, that's not true at all. They're planting 80 to 120 species. They're considering the future succession of all of that space. Wow. So, so they're planting not only their annual plants, you know, the corn beans and squash, the chili peppers, the chinopods, the amaranth, the tobacco, the sunflower, all that stuff. But then they're also planting, um, you know, the, the perennials that are going to start to come in. They're, gonna, they're planting the things that are going to become the, the new weeds. They're planting the fast growing, um, fodder trees and um, fiber trees. Wow. They're, plant they're planting the berries. They're planting the fruits. They're planting the nuts. They're planting the future canopy trees. And basically they've, they've had so much time to develop this deep ecological knowledge and awareness that they, they can uh, basically surf this wave of succession. I really think of it as, as, wow. as surfing because succession is going to unfold one way or the other. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you understand ecology, you know that there's all these various niches and that they're going to be filled with something or other. And so if you're there and you're part of that process, you can, uh, you can help, help make uh, that selection. And so basically the, you know, these, um, these old milpas, and milpa, as far as I can tell, means something like the inheritance upon which we all depend. Um, <laughs> oh, that's so nice. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so they have some really interesting metrics in the book. And two things I want to point out is that not only do these, these forests, after they've regrown, they're more biodiverse than the, the native forests surrounding them. And there's, there's higher species richness. But they also figure, you know, what was the population density of the Maya and how uh, how many people were these plots feeding and what percentage of the landscape was, were these plots taking up? And they've, they basically concluded that it was um, very high popula population densities that were comparable to modern um, urban or suburban environments. And they were using, they were intensively um, using for like, gardens in various stages of regrowth no more than 30 percent of the landscape at a time wow wow and the, the other thing that's great about what the the way the milpa worked is that it wasn't these rigid private property boundaries which you know we we know from history that be, that came about from the enclosure acts in europe and what what changed that was that was a really uh, critical moment in european history because Prior to the enclosure acts, the peasants did slash and burn too. You know, they would, that's, fallow was so important. You know, fallow is related to the word yellow and it, you know, it refers to that standing dried desiccated grasses and stuff. And that would have been burned off in Europe. And then it was, you know, it would have been uh, left to regrow after the annual cropping had happened. People planted hazelnuts and limes and pines and oaks into those. So there's anthropogenic forests all over Europe too. But then, you know, the, there were the, this British agricultural revolution, they came, the nobles and lords came up with this idea of enclosure because the, uh, the problem was that the peasants were just kind of roaming about the landscape and, you know, they, they couldn't be put in this nice, nice little box. They couldn't be taxed as easily too. So the, the people in power said, okay, we're going to carve property into discrete units and this is going to be your private property. And you're going to have, and basically it's forced people to farm in the same place year after year, mm -hmm. after year, after year. And of course, then you get into diminishing returns, yeah. right? And then, then you get into soil erosion and deforestation and loss of nutrition. And that's exactly what happened after the enclosure acts. Europe was rapidly deforested. Right. And then you, it created all these refugees and then they came to America and then they displaced the native people and then they deforested <laughs> that landscape and reasserted and took the, the same approach here. <laughs> exactly. But the uh, way the Mayans did it with the Milpa system is that you had you had plots that were in various stages of use, you know, so you had the fresh Milpa plot where corn, beans and squash were growing. But then you had the four year old Milpa plot where it was kind of turning more towards perennials and, you know, like woodies and things like that. And then you had 
the uh, the forest gardens and the the woodlands and the mature the the, the mature uh, old old growth kind of areas and it was a patchwork mosaic it was the shifting fluid landscape and the the fields would not be set in stone and so one thing that trees are amazing at is building soil mm. and I talked about the terra preta earlier this is how terra this is where terra preta came from it wasn't just the addition of biochar it was also all of the middens you know all of the the waste all the nutrient cycling being unbroken and letting to be in that spot but it was also the action of all those deep perennial root systems yeah moving right. all this nutrition through the From various deep, horizons yeah. of the soil right right and then that would be cut again and then it would regrow and you know that this this understanding of the the milpa is part of a total package it's um you know it's you, you can't just separate native american um forest management into like a clean discrete category like we do and say this is agroforestry yeah. and over here oh you've got silvopasture over here and over here you've got uh annual cropping you know or <laughs> 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 it was it was all together and i mean in yeah. your state in maine that the penobscot have this story of the green corn mother and they talk about how you know she had two sons and the people needed food to eat and so the the mother, the, the corn mother says, you know, what you got to do is you you have to sacrifice me. You have to kill me and you're going to hack my body into little bits and you're going to spread it over the earth seven times. You're going to go into this cleared field and you're going to spread all the bits of my body all over this field. And then you're going to come back seven moons later and corn will be growing everywhere. Mm. And you're going to save all the seeds of all the beings and you're going to replant them year after year after year. And, you know, on one level, we, we hear a story like that and they're like, oh, that's a weird story about human sacrifice. But on a deeper level, that's the story of slash and burn. That's the story of Milba. Right. That's the story of Swidening. And oh, is she in the story, she even says, you're going to burn my bones. That's a part of it too. She says, you're going to spread my body all over this right. clearing and then you're going to burn my bones. <laughs> it's that's like, the well, that's the biochar component though. Well, that's the fire. Yeah. That's the yeah. fire management component, right? right? Cause okay. when, when you go into woodland, you, you make all this slash and you've got all mm -hmm. this brush lying around yeah. and so you, you got to wait a few seasons for it to dry out. And when the conditions are right for it to combust, and then you, um, you, you burn that off and it, it burns down to a really rich layer of charcoal and ash which is and and basically because it was woodland too like the seed bank is at this late stage of succession so when you dramatically go into a space like that um you don't get a seed bank where like a bunch of annual plants are trying to come up and and you know because you sterilize them garden. with heat is that why the fire well, itself is you killed off those seeds you sterilize that that area but also those seeds aren't present because it was woodland for so long right oh yeah i got you okay because um, seeds only live in the seed bank for so many years generally there's a oh man there's a couple i want to come back to this because one of my questions is like okay so i live on 31 acres like uh, the idea that i could start a fire here seems like, you know like I don't know how that would work. And I'm really curious <laughs> about that. So I want to come back to that. But uh, you brought up human sacrifice and it. And I know this was in a, this is a metaphorical thing in this story, but you've also been talking about the Maya. And so here's where, where this is like a philosophical thing that I don't know how to reconcile. Um, so you're talking about the European system, which obviously at one point was an indigenous, you know, there was an indigenous community of people there living probably not so dissimilar from indigenous people around the world. Uh, we tend to look at Europe as like the, the seat of, you know, all like colonialism and control, but obviously it happened there. It didn't start that way. Right. Uh, but they get to this point you were just describing where it kind of sounds like they were letting like the peasant class, right. The aristocracy is like farming people for labor and then people are free range. And then they go, Hey, let's try this CAFO operation. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then they do this like high intensity thing where people have to stay in little confined spaces like you would with cattle that you used to free range. Right. So they go from being free range to, to captive in a sense. Uh, then they come here and they recreate that. And we look at that and it's like, that's terrible. Like we can't do that this anymore. But then, you know, when we look at the Maya, it's like, wow, talk about human sacrifice. Like in their city states, things got pretty gnarly too. Um, even if at the edges of it, they had a really beautiful, you know, kind of permaculture system going. 
Um, and that leads me to, so those are just observations and I'm open for you to, you know, um, kind of argue that however, but, um, but, uh, you know, it seems to me wherever you have city states, you tend to have a lot of this kind of human sacrifice thing happens at some level or things can get pretty bad. And one concern I have when I look at uh, how do we implement large scale um, regeneration, it seems like the people who, who are most interested in that stuff often lean towards sort of socialist and communist ideals. And the, the, what challenges me about those is every time I see them implemented, it seems like mass human death comes from it. You know, like the ideas always go like it's because because it's not like everybody here in the in the West is going to start teaming up and just work together on these projects. Right. Everybody's doing their own thing. Nobody's we don't have that blood relationship that we had in smaller communities. We don't have the that interwoven all those layers of connection between the community anymore. It's like everybody's been living for so long in their own little domiciles it's like we've lost the relation so getting everybody work together you it would almost have to be top down but whenever i see that kind of top down like we're all going to work together as a community it's like pretty soon you're like killing off half the population you know we see it around the world but obviously if we stick on the other side and we just do this like capitalist model the entire earth gets uh a, you know a price tag stuck on everything and it all gets um you know all resources get consumed until there's nothing left uh, how do you see this playing out? Like, I understand that at some level you're doing your work at an individual level and in a collective level with some folks. Um, but when you dream about this being played out at a large scale, how do we do it where it doesn't become an oppressive government forcing you to do it? <laughs> like in Cuba, for instance, <laughs> like Cuba, I hear has fantastic organic gardening and people get on like ragtag boats and try to get to Miami like every single day, you know, to escape the conditions there. So, you know, does my question make sense? And like, how do you it reconcile does. that? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a big question. So uh, it, I think change is going to have to always come from the bottom up. Um, I don't I don't believe in top down changes. I'm a big believer in democracy. I think democracy is the the single most important thing that we can practice. And again, this is getting back to this idea of reciprocity. So what, what is true democracy? You know, we, we've got this Western notion that, you know, democracy came from Athens and then, you know, was brilliantly formulated by the founding fathers from enlightenment thinking that that's all false. That's all bullshit. Let's put that aside over there. Real democracy comes from European encounters with indigenous societies and indigenous cultures. And I don't just mean native North American cultures, but they're certainly very important in this evolution, but you know, you've got the Europeans found them everywhere. (laughs) Right. Right. You know, uh, yeah, <laughs> they, they found them everywhere. And democracy is where everybody has a voice. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you don't just give a voice to the white men and the property owners and have this simple majority rules thing where 51% can vote one way and 49% vote the other way. You know, people like to chide the idea of democracy by saying it's two wolves and a sheep voting on what to have for dinner. But that's not democracy. That's the whole point. That's That's this lie that they've sold you. And said that, you know, this is democracy and you, you got to believe in this. Real democracy is consensus. And wow. you, you give a voice to women, you give a voice to children, you give a voice to nature, mm-hmm. you give a voice to the unborn generations, you give a voice to the ancestors. I mean, th- th- this is how Native societies around the world have, have thought. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it took people like Thomas Paine, who was basically this you know, swashbuckling character from, I think he was from Scotland or whatever, who basically couldn't fit in anywhere. And, you know, all that shit was happening in Europe. So he came and, you know, he sailed to the new world. And because he was kind of an an outsider, somebody on the margins on like a a fringe character, he got involved in uh, Native American Longhouse. And that set a fire on the Iroquois. Oh yeah. With the Haudenosaunee. Yeah. Right. And that set a fire that lit a fire under his ass. And then he wrote to common sense mm-hmm. and galvanized the world. And then Benjamin Franklin comes along and he's got a printing press and he's like, Oh, this, this stuff that's happening. This is really interesting. Let me, right. let me document what's happening in these native societies. And so then that oral culture was transformed into the written word and it spread like wildfire. Cause you know, the European people had never, never been aware of this. I mean, even Susan B. Anthony, you know, like the, um, 
the the feminist movement came out of Seneca Falls, New York, after their meetings <laughs> with Haudenosaunee people, so because cool. these, these were matriarchal cultures where the women were uh, very powerful leaders and, you know, movers and shakers in their community. Um, and, and of course, you know, it was uh, Kanasatego and Onondaga who stood up at the Treaty of Lancaster in 1740, while all the colonists were squabbling amongst themselves and basically said, you know, you guys are never going to amount to anything unless you can unify, unless you can agree, unless you can come to some kind of consensus and democracy. And so it was at that point that uh, a lot of the founding fathers were personally mentored by Native American elders in the ways of peacemaking, which is a very deep tradition um, that's tied up with creation stories and all kinds of stuff in the Haudenosaunee. And it wasn't just the Haudenosaunee, you know, you had like the Powhatan Confederacy, you had the, you know, the, the Shawnee, you had the Creek, uh, the Cherokee, all of these, all of these various groups in the East had um, democracies in one form or another. And so, of course, you know, when you take an oral culture and you translate it into the written word, it's going to take on the baggage of the culture that does that writing. And so when the founding fathers were coming up with all this stuff, they used words from the Enlightenment and concepts from the Enlightenment, which is why we misappropriate the, the true source of this stuff. But the founding fathers also co-opted democracy and they, uh, they didn't do it justice. And the Native people actually you know, they, 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 they warned us, you know, it was the, mm -hmm. I think it, what, what council was it? It was in 18, 18 something, early 1800s after the, found, I think it was the, one of the continental congresses, basically the, the native folks were, were still present and they said, you know, you guys didn't listen to us. You know, <laughs> you, this isn't a consensus democracy. Why aren't you giving voice to women? Why aren't you uh, giving voice to children? Why aren't you considering the, the lives of nature? And why are you enslaving Africans and denying right. them more than a voice? You know, And so, yeah, the, there are some, basically, you know, American democracy was a lie from the beginning. I know this is going to be controversial for me to say for some people, but. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm not challenged it, it all... by that, but I, can, I push, can I push on a couple of these points just to sure. see what's there with you? Um, okay, so pretty well established that the founding fathers based things off what they learned from the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois Confederation. And um, so I, I agree with you there. And uh, one thing I struggle with too is again, reconciling. So I guess this is another layer deeper than my first question. And thank you for that answer on that. Um, I think about how city states behave versus how, um, you know, tribal confederacies, let's say would behave. Uh, there is extreme violence in, on both sides of this, you know um, what we see in the city states is this kind of, uh, like genocidal thing that we'll see, or we'll see these large scale wars with large scale armies. Um, but when we look at the tribal groups and some of the ones you mentioned, while they have, like, while it's easy to paint a very beautiful picture of those cultures, cause they are in fact, extremely beautiful. I mean, like, look, like if I could go, if you could be like, Hey, do you want to stay here or get transported back to live in the longhouse? I'm like, send me there. So I, I see the beauty there, of course. But if you were the enemy of the, those cultures, uh, or if you were captured, um, it could be really, really bad. Uh, a slavery was fairly common, and mm -hmm. um, you know, intertribal warfare could get very brutal. And probably the most shocking to you, the European mindset, even though they were used to to warfare at, at the most atrocious levels, you know, that we could really conceive, they were quite shocked by the torture that was very common. Um, in those tribal groups, whether we're looking at the Iroquois or we start to go out West and, you know, look at the Sioux or just kind of anywhere we, we see this like torture thing that was going on. Um, so do you think that there's a, we're, we've meandered very far from Hickory and Oaks here, but <laughs> do you think that there's a, a chance for a, a cultural reorganization where we are less chimp like and more bonobo like, I guess, you know, less warring um, and less brutal, or is this a fixture of humanity uh, in your eyes? Because I, I think 
when we when we go around and we say like the way we're living is not sustainable like you can just jump ahead and go like well then it's going to end so what's next because if you it just that means it's going to end so what's next and do we ever get past this like do we have to choose between like you know smaller scale warfare with horrible torture or do you know wide scale warfare but everybody gets to live sort of safe from torture you know on as long as they're okay with the big wars happening <laughs> does that make sense yeah it does uh we need balance i mean yeah. humans humans are humans wherever they're found whoever they are you got good people you've got bad people and then you've got goodness in people and you've got badness in people yeah you know uh, that that line runs through each and every one of our hearts and i've definitely grown past the phase where i tend to think you know in, in black and whites like you know the indigenous people are perfect and colonized people are hopelessly corrupted you know, th this is just rehashing these ideas from Rousseau and Hobbes and mm -hmm. all this stuff. Um, and that's, that's a there's a lot of philosophical baggage there that sometimes we need to just set aside and look at things more truthfully. And so far as I can see it, the truth is that um, there aren't simple narratives, mm -hmm. that human, human beings are complicated. And all of the all of the wisdom traditions all around the world talk about the need for balance yeah. because we, we recognize that, you know, there, we need to find a balance between the, the good and the bad that's within us. Yeah. And when it come when it, when the, you close the circle and it comes full circle with the ecology, this is relevant too. I mean, there's the old, that old adage, don't lose the forest for the trees. I think a lot of what we're seeing in the modern world and the history that's led up to it has been this period where we have fallen out of balance and we have basically lost the forest for the trees. So think, think again about the, the milpa and what I've shared about slash and burn. Now, you know, you, you make the clearing and you're growing annual plants and then it transitions into woodland and then you move and you do it somewhere else. But if you can't move, Either you're constrained by outside forces like enforcement of private property, or what if you just forget and you stay settled in the same place over and over and over again? You know, then those diminishing returns start to enact themselves on the landscape, and what was previously a forested region becomes deforested. And when that happens, you lose traditional ecological knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know, so you you the the baseline shifts from under your feet. And suddenly you're thrust into this, you know, new world, this new ecology, this new, these new kinds of habitats. And in that process, there is a, there's a loss of knowledge and that loss of knowledge is the symptom of falling out of balance. So one of, one of the things that's happened in the history of human displacement is that people have been forced out of their ancestral land and their ancestral land is you know where the spirits of their ancestors reside mm -hmm. it's where all the, the beings bones of their that, ancestors do you know well that's if you look i mean a lot of people used to carry the bones of their ancestors when they would move from place to place i mean they talk about that in the bible like the the yeah. israelites are you know going to the promised land or whatever and they're carrying all the bones of their saints with them wow you know, because because that, that's like this indigenous understanding. It's like, well, we got to hold on to these pieces. We have to hold on to all these threads. Wow. Um, you know, and of course, you go into a new place and it, not just like you left the bodies of your ancestors, you left the bodies of the beings that have given you life mm -hmm. as long as you've been alive. All the trees, all the plants, all the animals that were in that place. And so just, just the act of displacement um, is a causes a tremendous imbalance you know it's like this wave and you know the only thing it can do is crash on shore mm. and i mean I, I i truly believe that's what we're in the wake of that's that's what we're seeing right now so how do you mean well you know it's this idea that hurting people hurt people yeah i mean right. it, it's 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 really tempting to you know fall into these black and white narratives where settlers came from Europe and genocided the native people and, you know, like damn the white man. And, you know, most days I'm fully on board with that, but, and, you know, speaking as a white man, but on the, on the other, on the other side, you know, you got to realize that there was this 
tremendous hurt, this tremendous grief, this tremendous loss, and this tremendous violence that was in Europe at the time. And a lot of the people who came over here were trying to escape that. They were trying to get the hell away from that. They were trying to find something meaningful. And that's why you had a lot of Scotch Irish settle in Appalachia because the, you know, the, the rolling hills and the topography kind of reminded them of the British Isles. And then you had, um, you know, people from the Ukraine and Eastern Europe who would also settle in Appalachia because you got that, the rolling hills and the trees and it kind of reminded them of, of home. And, uh, you know, so people are trying to get back to something that's sane. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and, and I mean, it's a complicated story, too, because, you know, when when you had the colony in New Sweden founded in, in Delaware in like the early 1600s, the Swedes, um, j- just like the uh, the English used their criminals to found Australia, like their mm-hmm. ruffians, right, right. you know, the, the Swedes took all their their rough, uncontrollable people. And a lot of the those uncontrollable people were like the 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 Finns, you know, like the, the people who were practicing slash and burn agriculture still in Sweden and Finland and were basically these ungovernable indigenous people. They were rounded up. They were used to build the colony of New Sweden. Oh, Guess wow. what they did when they when they came to shore? They mm-hmm. ran away, joined forces with the Lenape, and uh-huh. then the, the, the settlement, the, the early pioneer culture that we know about with the log cabin and the corn Right. And the, the 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 slash and burn cleared settlements and the the wormy fence, that was a hybrid culture between um, Lenape and uh, and European people, and wow. the the reason the pioneers kept pushing further and further west, at least the first wave of them, is because they were trying to get away from all the horror that they saw when their clearings were turned into towns and their towns were turned into cities. I mean, in, in Wisconsin, you've got an ethnic group called the, the Findians. They're, they're around today. And they're the f- Findians. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're Finnish Native American people. Yeah. Wow, because they, they, they recognized a kinship in each other because right. they, were both, they were both indigenous. They both practiced slash and burn from forested, from temperate forest regions. Um, and then, then you've got like these uh, anthropological mysteries, like George Catlin would talk about the, the Mandan people and how mm-hmm. they were so mysterious, how they're their customs were different from all the other native people, how they were like very tall and they had fair hair and blue eyes and all this stuff. And anthropologists, they don't really know what to do with these people, but you know, I, I read accounts like that and I'm like, Oh yeah, well, of course they're the hybrids, you know, there's, those are the runaway whites and the runaway native Americans and, you know, run runaway slaves were in the mix too. You know, some of the largest proportions of native American blood that we can find in America today are among African American people. Um, wow. because, because that's that's how native people were you know they practiced exogamy you know they you, you can't live in these tiny little band societies forever without inbreeding being a problem so it was it was part of their culture to welcome outsiders yeah so yeah it, it's it, again it's not a simple narrative <clears throat> it's not black and white very nuanced yes <laughs> very nuanced which is which doesn't make for good uh headlines sound bites or, or short you know tiktok videos unfortunately uh we're like nuance is like a dying art you know um talk to me about the way forward how you see it you know and um because you talking to you you know you're brilliant and well educated obviously on this topic and um it's really refreshing to hear some of your perspectives um and i don't get the sense that you, you doing what you're doing is just because you like eating hickory nuts. It's like bigger than that for you. It sounds like, you know, <laughs> I'm sure you love hickory nuts. I think we all do, but, but it's bigger. Um, so, you know, talk to me about like what your dream is, like what you would like, what, how, how would it play out? How would you like to see things start to unfold in the world uh, as we move forward um, at this like really precarious moment, ecologically and socially and everything? Well, when I was a kid and I had, you know, problems or whatever, you know, I was, I was, I had, I had trouble, you know, making friends when I was younger or whatever. And so when I would run away, I would go to the woods and that was, that was where I found solace. That's where I found peace. That's where I found, you know, like a deeper kind of family than I had ever known before. And of course, when you're a kid, you don't really understand what that is. You're just like, Oh, I like to go to the Creek. I like to fish. I like to hang out in the woods, you know, and I like to, you know, camp, but um, you know, as I became an adult, I realized how important that foundational influence was in my life. And, I'm, you know, truthfully, I'm, I'm lucky to have it. Um, 
So, you know, I, I think one of the ways that we can get out of this cycle of trauma is to look outside of ourselves and look at the, um, the good relationships in our life, the, the people who give to us, the people who share with us. And I don't just mean people in the human sense, I'm including them, but I mean, non-human persons too yeah the the more than human world you know the the trees that are feeding us the plants that are feeding us the flowers that bring us beauty the clean air the clean water all this stuff and you know the 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 more we can go towards that the more we can heal the strife that's going on within us so uh, on a personal level you know that's that's been my healing journey but on a cultural level i want to share that with other people and so if it means getting my hands dirty with uh, the capitalist economy to try to um, build a cottage industry around nut trees, I'll do that because experience is what creates knowledge. And if people can have an experience of these foods, mm-hmm. um, not just trees, but the native roots, like the ground nut, the camas, the spring beauty, um, you know, all, all that stuff. If, if people can experience this stuff, they can learn to love it. And when, and you know, that they can, or they can value it, you know, they can learn to value it. And when they value it, they'll love it. And when they love it, they'll treat it well. And also, you know, in that experience, they'll start to uh, pick up the threads again and get the knowledge that we need to move forward. I truly believe that the solution is a return to ecological knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge, Oh, dude, that's I'm on the same page as you with that. That's like, uh, it. What What's interesting about the wild food culture here is that so many folks, uh, it's about so much more than food, and I, it's almost like sometimes hard to communicate that. But it's like there's a lot of sort of shared ideas that that are about way more than just what's on your plate. It's like. Uh, we're trying to save the world, damn it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I really appreciate that. I'm not trying to save the world anymore. I'm j- yeah. I just want to, on a personal level, I just want to be a good elder. Mm-hmm. I've had a lot, I've had a lot of advantages. Um, I've, I've had a lot of good things happen in my life and I want to pass on the torch as it was passed on to me. Yeah. Well, wow, man, I'm really glad we talked today. I got a lot out of this and uh, hope we can talk again sometime. I'd love to you know, talk some, about some specific plants and things like that. But uh, today it just felt really nice to get some of this bigger picture philosophy. So uh, thank you so much for that. And uh, tell people uh, where they find you and all that kind of stuff. Sure. Um, the only social media I have these days is Instagram. I'm a Woodland Rambler on that. I've got an email address um, and the, the websites I mentioned, um, yeah, futureforestplants.com, keystonetreecrops.com, nomadseed.com. Uh, and uh yeah that's that's where you can find me thanks for listening to the wild fed podcast help us grow this show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review it ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest which translates directly into better shows more awesome guests and a constant stream of fresh new content have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting fishing or foraging trip you'd like to host us on email us at info at wild-fed.com. If you still haven't seen season one of the Wild Fed TV show, you can go to myoutdoortv.com, grab yourself a free trial subscription, and then check out all 10 episodes. Season two of Wild Fed premieres on Outdoor Channel in early 2022. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out our store for Wild Fed hats, stickers, and more. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.